Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor to be asked to deliver a lecture on Nizami at the University of Ganja. I am one of the many who profoundly admire the great poet and sage Nizami Ganjavi. When I first visited Azerbaijan, I came to Ganja and visited his mausoleum. He is truly a global figure who continues to inspire artists to this day, from Germany's Goethe to contemporary poets, from Azerbaijan's Karakaraev to the West's Eric Clapton. Nizam al-Din Abu Muhammad Ilyas ibn Yusuf ibn Zaki was born around 1142 in the town of Ganja, Azerbaijan. By the time of his death in 1209, he would leave his stamp on Azerbaijani history, Farsi literature, and global culture. He is known to everyone as Nizami. Molded by the indigenous Azerbaijani tradition, he showed how genius can go from the specific to the universal, and how culture-specific writing and characters can appeal to all of humanity. Steeped in local folklore, he transcended it to produce some of the greatest lyrical and epic poetry of the world. Educated locally, he became an acknowledged sage of his era, renowned for his vast knowledge of almost every subject. Brought up on the local language and dialect through his writing and his poetry, he became one of the greatest contributors to the Farsi language and to world literature. Nizami was not a court poet. He was a man of the people. Thus, he does not appear in the annals of the dynasties, even though by his achievements, the compilers of the literary memoirs known as the Tazkere did acknowledge his immense contributions. But if court poets and chroniclers would have him out of the records of the courts, he certainly lived in the hearts of the people. And today, the world bears witness to his genius as an amazing poet, a distinguished philosopher, and a sage, a hakim of immense erudition. Today, his biography appears in all reference works. And in one of these, he is credited with a prodigious knowledge of mathematics, astronomy, astrology, alchemy, medicine, botany, Quranic exegesis, Islamic theory, Islamic law, Persian myths and legends, history, ethics, philosophy, and esoteric thought, music, as well as the visual arts. From his work, especially the Khamsa, we recognize his knowledge of the great myth and works of literature in both Arabic and Farsi. In addition to his profound appreciation of local oral and written popular traditions. Nizami was a bridge builder through time and space. He helped connect the Persian cultural heritage moving seamlessly between its pre-Islamic legacy and its manifestly Islamic traditions. However, although he emphasized the value of his religious legacy, Nizami was always praising moderation and he never advocated extreme religious practices. Furthermore, his work transcended not only the Persian cultural heritage, it also connected with the Arabic traditions of other Muslim peoples of his time. Thus, while Nizami was primarily an Azerbaijani writer, he mastered the entire cultural heritage of his time. We find him influenced by Ferdowsi's enormous Shahnameh, the Book of Kings, from which he drew to produce his own masterworks, just as Shakespeare would draw or Hollinshead to write his great historical plays. 
echoes of some of Nizami's influence can be found in the later works of poets writing in Farsi. Today, Nizami is primarily remembered as a poet, and justly so. But in his time, he was also seen as a sage, a hakim, a great and honored title in recognition of his philosophic bent and his enormous knowledge of all fields of learning. Even today, he is quite often referred to as a philosopher, though he did not produce great synthetic works such as Ibn Sina or great Sufi works such as the Futuhat al makkiyah of Ibn Arabi. On the other hand, he was deeply concerned with society and the human condition. Indeed, as MacDonald remarks, Nizami was a genuine social reformer. Nizami's personal life was marred by tragedy. He lost his first wife, whom he loved dearly, the slave girl Apak, or Snow White, whom he freed and married, but who died after six years, leaving him with a small boy. She was probably the most important love of his life. And much later, in his last great work, the Iskandar Nami, he mentions her and the pain he suffered on losing her. Twice more, family tragedy would strike him during his long life. And some have speculated that his sensitivity to pain and suffering was drawn from his personal experience. But great artist that he was, he would create well-rounded characters in his epic poems and would communicate their feelings and motivations with enormous sensitivity which moves us to this day. Nizami visited the court only once, detested it, and would not return even when he received an official invitation to go there. About the company of kings, he writes, refrain from seeking the society of kings, like exposing dry cotton to fire's burnings, light from the fire may be pleasant enough, but to be safe, one must stay a distance off. The moth that's allured by the flame of a candle is burnt when a companion at the banquet table. Nizami managed to live comfortably in a village thanks to his earnings from his poetry. And in the long introduction to Layla and Majnoon, he mentioned Kizil Arslan's gift, which enabled him to live a quiet country life, which he loved. He was not only content to live that modest life, but he also advocated it as the basis of true happiness. In your village, upon your own private estate, don't think of eating from another's plate. Fortune will turn upon the unthinking fellow whose foot beyond his garment will allow. This is reminiscent of the words of Alexander Pope as a young man when he calls for a quiet life and says, happy the man whose wish and care, a few paternal acres bound, content to breathe his native air in his own ground. But where Pope would claim, thus let me live unseen, unknown, thus unlamented let me die, steal from the world and not a stone, tell where I lie, Nizami was very conscious that his poetry would make him famous through the ages. He was proud of his poetic achievements and struggled with his pleasurists and his critics, usually ignoring them, but occasionally speaking out against them. But at the same time, he considered that pious and glorious men have long suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and have been obliged to endure enmities without deserving them. But he believed that patience and rising above responding to such critics was the right path. And he never returned the affronts 
and the harm, even saying, for as long as I have lived, never in violent way has the wing of a fly been bent, never mixed dregs in another's fresh water sought to disturb another's condition, never. But Nizami went further. Not only did he advocate not doing harm to one's enemies, but also that the best way to use one's short time here on this earth was to be good to one's neighbors and friends. And from dusk to dawn, for life to stay is hopeless. Only seed worth growing is the seed of goodness. And because the world will not stay for anyone, being kind to one's friends is best. This I stress. Nezami was open to all the cultures of his time. He told all to be open to these cultures of the world and they would benefit enormously from such openness. He says in the Khirad Nami that he researched in all the tongues and found pearls and gems of wisdom that he collected and polished with his poetry to integrate them into a whole. From every manuscript some worth came to me, I found and embellished it with jewels of poetry. I filled up my store from the more recent history, the Jewish and Armenian and also the Pahlavi. I took from every grain that which was excellent, and in from each pod innermost kernel went, I joined riches of one tongue to those of another, and the mass into complete whole did I gather. So Nizami was not only a great poet, he was undoubtedly the master of the Masnavi, or the Mathnawi, form of long poems composed of rhyming couplets. Hafiz of Shiraz, born in the 1320s and died in 1392, is a century after Nizami's death, and perhaps the world's greatest mystical poet in his book of the Winebringer, a Masnavi poem, was so influenced by Nizami's Masnavi that begins and ends his Layla and Majnun that he says, in wisdom's opinion, there's no better adorner of poetry in this old sphere than the pearls of speech of Nizami. Nizami was also a master of all forms of other poetry. He mastered language, meter, rhyme, imagery, and metaphor. He collected his personal poems in his divan throughout his life. And it is said that his divan had some 20,000 poems, of which only 4,500 survive today. These include rubaiyat, qata'a, qasidas, ghazals, showing a great diversity of styles, and the mastery of all. His subjects would vary, but he tended to lean towards religious mysticism and ethical issues. And Qazvini, writing shortly after his time, says that Nizami wrote a beautiful divan of which the poems are mostly of a religious or admonitory or ethical character, and which contain indications for the initiated and their symbols. So, the sage was always present in the poet, and the religious mystic was there in the quiet man who lived his simple country life, producing his stream of historic masterpieces. His death in 1209 would leave a void in the world of literature, and Jamia, the last great poet of Persia in his masterpiece Joseph and Zuleikha, sadly emphasizes the loss of so great a talent, so wonderful a person, and says, where is Nizami? Where is his soul alluring poetry, delicate refinements of his genius full of subtlety? He has gone, taking his place behind the screen, and all but him remaining outside have been, since he withdrew, we have received no portion except those mystical words he took everyone 
None knew them except he who God is near, whose true heart with the divine is made clear. He washed his soul from the image of diversity, seeking to fill it again with the mystery of unity. That was the judgment of the great poets of the great Nizami himself. But let us get back to his greatest legacy to the entire world, his enormously influential contributions to epic and lyrical poetry. His works are still read, studied, and admired. Much has been written and said about that great poet and his five jewels, the Khamsa, Arabic for five. Quite simply, he is the towering figure of romantic epic narrative poetry in Farsi. His choice of subjects, his style, his use of the rhyming couplet, his originality, all make the Khamsa, the Five Jewels, an unequaled masterpiece, which Shelkowski describes as one of the finest collections of poetical tales in Persian or Farsi literature, is the Khamsa or the Quintet of Nizam. These tales, written during the last third of the 12th century, abound with action, intrigue, pageantry, and romance. The plots are dramatic, the characters full-blooded and vulnerably human in their psychological makeup. And the overall design is so rich in allegorical meaning that the reader becomes deftly attuned to the higher plane of mystical thought. As a composite and panoramic view of life, these tales are a match for any chivalric romance in the West. The first of Nizami's five jewels is the Mahzan al-Asrar, or the storehouse of the mysteries. It was composed in the 1160s or the 1170s, and it is the only one that is not a narrative epic romance. It is a reflective and didactic quasi-philosophical poem of 2,250 rhyming couplets. It's divided into 20 chapters, each covering a discourse on a religious or ethical subject. Each chapter is signed by Nizami. In this poem, Nizami sketches out his vision of the ideal way of life, banning injustice and hypocrisy, vanity and selfishness. Nizami addresses all of mankind not just the king to whom it is dedicated. However, Nizami's language play and his use of philosophical and scientific learning makes this work difficult for the average reader. And this is probably the work with which Nizami most approaches the Sufi tradition. In fact, in the introduction, he specifically mentions his khalwat, or meditative solitary visuals. Mahzan al-Asrar was highly regarded and it influenced among many some great works such as Amiri Khosro's Matla al-Anwar or the Dawn of Lights and Qajuk Kermani's Rawzat al-Anwar, the Garden of Lights and Jamia's Tuhfat al-Ahrar, the Gift of the Noble. Later on, with the other four of the five jewels, Nizami finds his true vocation, to be the greatest poet of romantic epics in the Muslim world. It is also in these four other jewels that Nizami rightly earns his attribute of bridge builder. Khusru, or Shirin, literally Khusru and Shirin, the first of these four jewels is a remarkable epic romantic narrative. It is titled Khusru Sharin, which he wrote in 1177 to 1181, and it is influenced by earlier pre-Islamic Persian traditions, notably the story of King Khusru's courtship of Princess Sharin and winning her over his rival Farhad. 
they all die at the conclusion and there is no happy ending. The story is told with great lyrical intensity. The structure of the narrative is quite complex using several genres simultaneously. It contains many verbal exchanges and letters, all imbued with poetic power. It is not surprising that ill-fated lovers are at the heart of this dramatic poem. That is the basic staple of many of the great works of literature, perhaps reaching a pinnacle with Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. But Khosrow and Shireen deserves to be listed as a true masterpiece. With a hitherto unique artistic and structural unity, it would have a tremendous influence on later authors. It is rightly seen as a turning point, not only for Nizami, but for all of Farsi literature. It also shows his ability to bridge the pre-Islamic Farsi tradition with the subsequent Islamic heritage of his own time. For the story is told by Ferdowsi in the Shahnama and is based on a true story that was further romanticized by Farsi poets such as Gogani in his Vizo Raman. Of particular interest here is the way that Nizami treats Farhad, a person for whom he adds to the story. In many ways, I find Farhad the true hero of the story, regardless of the title of the poem. For it is Farhad's love for Shireen that is tested. It is to win her that he undertakes the impossible task of reshaping the mountains and redirecting the natural flow of rivers and creates a masterwork so immense, so stunning, that people come from far and near to admire and to learn from the masterpiece. And one of the most moving passages is when he, Farhad, is told falsely that Sharin has died. And he contemplates his work for the last time that monumental work, where every blow of the axe had been to the rhythm of his soul, calling out to her, Oh no, Shireen! He contemplates and he says, Beyond the portals of death, my Shireen, I will greet. So with one leap, death, I now hasten to meet. And far into the wide expanse his chisel axe he flung, and from that terrible precipice, at once he sprung. The rocks, the sculpted caves, the valleys green, sent back unheard his dying cry, Oh no, Shireen. Adding beyond that great masterpiece, on top of the other comes Layla and Majnoon. Layla and the Madman, Layla and the Possessed. It's another story of unfulfilled love. Written in 1192, it is a story of Arabic origin, absorbed and embellished by Farsi storytellers. The poem is 4,600 rhyming couplets long, is less than half the length of the future Iskandar Nama another of his five jewels. Like Khosrow and Shireen, it is a legend of ill-starred lovers. The poet Qais falls in love with his cousin Layla, but her father disapproves, and they are prevented from marrying. The distraught Qais roams the desert, obsessed with his love, and lives with animals and writes poetry. She resists her marriage to another, but Qais returns to her after she dies and cries at her tomb. The obsession of Qais becomes so severe that he is given the sobriquet, the possessed, or the madman, Majnoon, Majnoon Layla. Nizami has added much of his own to the Arabic parts that make up the story. The same theme would, of course, be taken up by Shakespeare in his masterpiece of Romeo and Juliet four centuries later. And in the early 20th century, Ahmad Chauqi, the greatest Arab poet of his time, would also use the story of Layla and Majnoon 
to write a beautiful verse play by the same name. Initially, Nizami was dubious about attempting this project. While the love story was very moving, he was concerned that the setting was too severe, too austere for his poetic images. Rocks, desert, the Arabian arid wilderness as a stage, two simple children as his heroes, nothing but unhappy passion. How could he turn that into a great epic poem? Yet he did, bringing out all the force of unrequited love, the agony of the separation, and the almost mystical transformation of worldly love to a sublimated love that touches the divine. His poem, well structured, skillfully connected the parts of the story to maximum effect. It remains unsurpassed, although great poets like Hatifi and Jama as well as that other great Azerbaijani poet Fuzuli, tried their hand at that same material. But they fell short of Nizami's masterpiece. Nizami drew on prior and original material to produce Layla and Bajnoon. Isfahani's Kitab al-Aghani devoted some 90 pages to the story of Qais the Majnoon. But Nizami also had access to the material of Qais ibn al-Mulawah himself, who lived in the second half of the 7th century among the Bedouin Arabs, the Banu Amir tribe in Najd. But if these were the raw materials he employed, the edifice he constructed was completely his own. Yet, we are told that he constructed that magnificent edifice, that he wrote the entire 4,000 couplets in less than four months. And he boasts that if he had not had other duties, he could have finished it in two weeks. How can anyone produce such an amazing literary masterpiece in so short a time? Ah, that is where you can differentiate genius from mere talent. It was this ability to bring to life these amazing love stories that would make Nizami famous among writers through the centuries. Indeed, the great Goethe says of him, a gentle, highly gifted spirit who, when Ferdowsi had completed the collected heroic traditions, chose for the material of his poems the sweetest encounters of the deepest love. Majnoon and Layla, Khosru and Shireen. Lovers he presented, meant for one another by premonition, destiny, nature, habit, inclination, passion, staunchly devoted to each other, but divided by mad ideas, stubbornness, chance, necessity, and force and then miraculously reunited, yet in the end again, in one way or another, torn apart and separated from each other. Thus did Goethe recognize the talent of the magnificent sage. But despite the enormous appeal of Layla Ajmajnoon, it is, I think, the Haft Paikar or the Seven Beauties, also sometimes called the Bahram Nameh, or the book story of the King Bahram Gur, which is probably the greatest of these five jewels. A pre-Islamic Farsi story, it is a romanticized biography of the Sassanian Persian Empire ruler Bahram Gur. Bahram's life and adventures had already been written about by Ferdowsi in the Shahnameh, which is acknowledged by Nizami. But the great poet has his own interpretation of the story. He omits or passes over lightly the parts of the story that Ferdowsi had covered and concentrates on new material. Thus, his work remains original. In fact, Nizami's Haft Paikar, or the Seven Beauties, is much more than a chronicle of the history of a king. 
he builds his masterwork on it. Just as Shakespeare built his historic plays, taking the actual history of England as a platform to build his masterful literary creations, Nizami weaves together the harmony of the universe, the links between the profane and the sacred, and many themes to produce an exciting, fast-moving story with interesting characters, and while so doing, again links ancient and Islamic traditions. It is one of the most important creations of Farsi literature, and even of all non-Western literature, and deserves a place with the best of global literature. He drew from all the available literature before him. He cites Tabari and Bukhari and other books in Arabic and Farsi. He drew what pearls he could find, but he just used that as raw material to build his own masterful construction. Seven, a mystical number for many, plays an important role in that story of King Bahram Gur. But the stories are complex and have many interconnected vignettes. For one example, Bahram Gur had the slave girl Fitna. She was his favorite and he wanted to show off for her in his hunt. He asked her to challenge his talent with the bow to hit any part of the animal he was hunting. Coquettishly, she challenged him to transpear the animal in the hoof and the ear with one shot. He threw a piece of clay into the animal's ear and when the animal tried to dislodge it from his ear, he shot his bolt and pinned the hoof to the ear. He had achieved the impossible challenge. But instead of acknowledging his amazing talent, Fitna told him that this only proved that he had practiced a lot with his bow and that practice makes perfect. He was so angry that he ordered her taken away to be put to death. She pleads with the soldiers who take her and they spare her and she goes into the forest where there is a house or an inn with the stairs of 60 steps and she lives there in secret and every day she carries a newborn calf up the stairs until she can actually carry it the whole stairs. Years later the king visits that inn in the forest and sees this woman carry a calf on her shoulders, an impossible feat. He asks to meet her and asks how she could do it and she says Practice makes perfect. He then looks at her face and recognizes his beloved Fitna and regretted his prior rash decision begins to understand and the reconciliation ensues. And that is just one of the many, many vignettes in the Hafta Paikar of Nizami. Ah, I wish we would have days and days on end to speak of it. But let me talk about the fifth jewel of the Khamsa, for it is no less fascinating and important. The Iskandar Nama or the Book of Alexander. It is a romanticized chronicle of Alexander the Great and intermixed with it the character of Dhul Qarnayn. The poem covers three alleged stages of Alexander's life. First, conqueror of the world then a seeker after knowledge, gaining enough wisdom to acknowledge his own ignorance. And finally, as a prophet crisscrossing the world to proclaim monotheism. Not historically accurate, but a work of art of the first order. It is based on the religious myths of Alexander, composed close to or at the turn of the 13th century, this epic romance of Alexander the Great contains an amazing 10,500 couplets. It is not absolutely certain if it or the Haft Paikar was the last of the five jewels to be composed, but it remains an important part of the five jewels of Nizami. In the Iskandar Nami, the poet reaches another peak. As we just said, he started with an original design that had three components but he ended up by folding the two latter parts into one 
And so we have two books in the saga. The first is called the Sharaf Nama or the Iqbal Nama. In it, we see Alexander as conqueror. Here we see the abilities of Nizami in calling forth his poetic talents to recreate in the mind's eye the sense of battle with all its bugle calls, pomp and majesty, but also all the dust, the dirt, and the blood and the clashes of wars. In the second book, the Khirad Nameh of the Alexander Saga, the Book of Wisdom, he goes beyond giving his perfect hero wisdom. He endows him with that stage beyond wisdom, prophecy. As usual, Nizami's craftsmanship with the words in the couplets allows him not only to tell the story, but also to reflect on the meaning of wisdom and the dimension of prophecy. In reviewing the body of work of Nizami, it is interesting to note his attitude towards women, his advice to his son, and who might have inspired him. What's intriguing about Nizami's depiction of women is that in his epic romantic poems, they are indeed endowed with great beauty, elevated on a pedestal, and are objects of desire that inspire men to great deeds, as when Farhad literally moves mountains to win the love of Shirin. But the greatness of Nizami is that he does not limit himself to this typical idealized view of women so prevalent in his times and found also in so many of the chivalry tales in East and West, where beautiful and chaste damsels in distress inspire courageous knights to slay the dragon and rescue the damsel. Nizami portrayed women as full-blooded creatures, well-rounded, who evolved over time and who could be the equal of men in every way even in the most unusual, such as physical strength. A striking example of this is how the coquettish fitna in the Hafta Paikar achieves that. She tells the king that anything can be achieved by determination because practice makes perfect and is sent to her death for her insolence, but is spared and lives unknown for six years, during which she learns to carry a calf on her shoulders and carry it up and down 60 steps, a feat that few men could equal in physical strength. Likewise, it is a wise woman, Queen Nushaba, Nushaba of Barda, who teaches an important lesson to Alexander the Great in the Iskandar Nama. The queen, who had recognized Alexander, who had come disguised as a messenger, tells him that she knows who he is and then offers him jewels and gold to eat, which he refuses, to which she points out that yet men are killed for such treasure. And then she offers him bread, which is produced by the same men who are killed for the inedible jewels and stones. In Nizami's world, the women learn and his princesses are educated, skillful, and wise, as well as beautiful. In Layla and Majnoon, the two adolescents meet in school, where they study together, side by side, until Qais is smitten by Layla's beauty. Thus, Nizami's views of women as complete beings that can match men in intellect, determination, and even physical strength, as well as being beautiful, evanescent creatures that attract and inspire men is noteworthy. It is one more interesting facet of the magnificent sage of Ganja. And sage he was. Listen to Nizami's advice to his departing son. He was overwhelmed by the loss of his beloved Apak and he loved his son Muhammad who would later grow up and go to court against Nizami's wishes who disliked court. However, Nizami then imparts advice to his departing son, much as Shakespeare in his play Hamlet, first scene of Act 3, would later have Polonius advise his departing son Laertes. Nizami says to his son Muhammad, 
Nothing deserves to be preferred to being a friend. A friend who will hold you by the hand to the end. That friend, tightly, by the cords of the heart, you must tie. And here is Shakespeare's Polonius in Hamlet. Those friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. And on the importance to tell the truth always and to avoid lies is also in the advice of Nizami and of Shakespeare Polonius. Nizami says, but let the law instruct you in God's service. Let it not teach you how to lie. This I stress. And Polonius says in Shakespeare's play, this above all to thine own self be true. And it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. It is, of course, natural that fathers sending their sons into the world would emphasize this kind of advice. But it is striking that would be recorded in such verse by great poets, once for a real son and once for the bard's creation. Do we find echoes of another great poet, Omar Khayyam? Well, Nizami, who read very widely, was obviously inspired by many of his great predecessors, even if his own work remains very distinctive. Thus, we note that he took much of the historical material from Ferdowsi's Shahnama, the Book of Kings, and drew for Leila and Majnoon from Asfahani's Kitab al aghani and for Khosru and Shireen, he was obviously influenced by Ghani's Vizu Rahman. All of that does not in any way diminish his own magisterial contributions. But it shows how art and culture function. For as John Donne so aptly said, no man is an island. But perhaps lesser known is the echo of Omar Khayyam, who lived from 1048 to 1131, that I hear in some passages of Nizami's poetry. Listen to Khayyam in Fitzgerald's rendition of the Rubaiyat. Dreaming when dawn's left hand was in the sky, I heard the voice within the tavern cry, Awake, my little ones, and fill the cup before life's liquor in its cup be dry. And as the cock crew and those who stood before the tavern shouted, open then the door. You know how little while we have to stay and once departed may return no more. The echo in Nizami's Divan as given by Smith's rendition. I went to the wine house last night, but away and I couldn't see. I called and called, but no one inside seemed to listen to me. I either no wine cellar was awake or because I was nobody. In there, nobody cared to open the door for me, obviously. And the wine cellar finally answers his pleas by saying, it's not the time when doors open by one for anyone. Be more thoughtful. It's no mosque where door is always open, where you can come and go and push to the front deliberately. Every religious community in the world is here. Muslims, Hindus, Zoroastrians, Christian Jews, one community. Listen, if you've anything to say, then first you should go and make yourself dust under their feet. It is that easy. Now, it is clear that Nizami is not speaking of a literal tavern where wayfarers and locals go to imbibe real wine and get drunk. Indeed, Hafiz, the great mystical poet, decades after Nizami, wrote a magnificent Masnavi poem which he called the Book of the Wine Bringer. Khayyam, who preceded Nizami by a century, was a polymath, and his Sufi tendencies would have been well known and probably well studied by Nizami, the amazingly erudite sage of Ganja. So even if Fitzgerald's popular rendition of the Khayyam quatrains gives them a more earthy flavor, the original is closer to the meaning of Nizami's lines and therefore deserves 
some mention here. But what about Nizami's legacy? Where does all this leave us? Nizami's work is more than a paramount symbol of great Farsi literature. It is indeed part of the global heritage of humanity. It has, like all great legacies, reached universality through deep-rooted traditions, interpreted with great art, tradition and art. It combines the storyteller's skill with the lyrical language of the poet. But what makes it great art is his richness of expression, characterization, use of metaphor, and sheer virtuosity of storytelling. In all of that, Nizami is unequaled. In his review article, New Light on Nizami, Nagjabani comments on the poet's standing and the renown, saying that it is of great interest to modern and postmodern readers that Nizami's medieval epistemology approaches the boundaries of the contemporary theory of intertextuality in its most general and consequential form. In addition, in addition, we all feel that beyond the art and craft of the wordsmith and the storyteller, there is the sincerity of Nizami. You feel that his sense of justice is real, it is not feigned, his spirituality reflects genuine piety, not a showy religiosity. His deep concern for the human condition is not just for the characters in his epics, but for all people. In doing so, he joins the ranks of the immortals. Nizami's masterpieces, his khamsa, like all great classics from Homer to Shakespeare to the recent past, have stood the test of time. So it is most appropriate that he is celebrated not just in his native Azerbaijan, but in the whole world. Thank you.